Have you ever wished you had a healthcare provider on speed dial? Someone you could call to validate your product market fit. Someone to listen and help you see your solution differently. Welcome to Healthcare Market Matrix, a podcast to help you see your market clearly. We dive deep into the challenges faced by healthcare organization leaders that technology has the chance to help them solve. It's all about gaining the kind of understanding you need to effectively connect with your market. Join us as we explore the healthcare market matrix. Well, welcome to Healthcare Market Matrix. I'm your host, John Farkas, and today we have the privilege of sitting down with Tom Mitchell. Tom is a seasoned healthcare, dare we say grizzled, uh, healthcare industry expert with over 30 years uh, in and around the healthcare universe. And he has a lot of backdrop in leading strategy, uh, marketing operations for some high growth healthcare and technology firms globally. And he brings a wealth of knowledge and insights to our discussion today. Um, he's also a longtime board member of the Tennessee uh, Tennessee Hymns, and for those of you who may not know, Tennessee is certainly one of the most vital uh, national chapters of the of the Hymns organization. So we uh, we like to brag about that. And he's also the founder of uh, Stratapoint Advisory, and they're dedicated to helping drive high value go to market strategy for organizations through their research, uh, strategic planning, and execution. So, Tom, welcome to Healthcare Market Matrix. Thank you. Truly an honor to be here. <laughs> well, to start off, I'd love for you to give us a little bit of a backdrop of your journey. I mean, tell us, tell us how you got where you are, what were some of the stops on the road. I know you've got a few, uh, certainly a few interesting chapters. Yeah, definitely. So uh, in mid '90s, started kind of my my healthcare journey uh, with research, actually, um, and research content and pushing that out. If you remember the days of CD-ROMs, when you'd go into a library uh, and uh, put in a CD-ROM, and it would tell you, "Hey, go find this article in this serial publication." If you're doing some research, uh, so started out working in that industry. I uh, focus on biomedical, and we pushed that, believe it or not, to the internet and got away from the CD-ROMs. Um, so that was uh, really pushing content to the internet from a very tangible type of product and uh, making that content accessible. And that was a global organization, and that was fun. Uh, so working with uh, uh publications like New England Journal of Medicine to very esoteric other type publications so with very niche type content. Then I went from there to, uh, to the revenue cycle space um, and, you know, kind of got my chops in going, uh, going from, from content to truly, truly hardcore kind of marketing in, in a very, uh, uh, uh I would almost say consumer centric claims, uh, claims type model and uh, working with an organization that had one of the largest claims clearing houses in the industry at the time, pushing billions of dollars of claims through annually a clearing house and uh, kind of different different formats from an on prem to a subscription type and SaaS based model in the early days and then working in different areas, you know, uh, from from clinical side to payer relations, uh, running strategy for electronic health record company. And then uh, with my own firm working across radiology perspectives, uh, um, anesthesiology firms, uh, provider organizations. Uh, so uh, yeah, grizzled I think is the right word <laughs> to use when you talk about 30 years uh, across the healthcare spectrum, probably been in hundreds of hospitals and every payer organization in the United States over the years to physician practices, radiology clinics in almost every state that you can, can think of. Um, so it's been a, been a fun journey. I will tell you uh, a lot of great relationships. And I think that's a big key, key part of it is the relationship factor that you gain in this industry. 
And uh, when you talk about health care and uh, relationships I've had for over 30 years, and I'm proud to, uh, to still call friends uh, and colleagues um, from those relationships and, 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 and working with, with uh, people like you, John. So, Well, way to, way to put the warm fuzzy at the end of that one. <laughs> Thanks, Don. <laughs> um, hey, I am, uh, I- I'm curious because you, you, coming from the marketing kind of angle, because that's a little different from a lot of our guests here, uh, we're, you know, we're talking to folks that are in the marketing space, but a lot of who we're talking about are, are talking with are people that are our targets. But I'm curious, um, can you share with us your experiences in your, your role specifically around, you know, what have you encountered from, um, you know, some of your reporting structures, uh, how have you, how have you traditionally measured success and how, uh, and what are the metrics that you are accustomed to looking at as you are looking at, uh, really diving into the marketing realm and helping a, helping a health tech company be successful in that regard? Yeah, and I think there's a lot of different ways to uh, to look at that, but I, I categorize, you know, marketing effort in kind of three buckets, what I call awareness, preference, and demand. And awareness is traditional, uh, you know, paid placement, advertising, public relations, trying to create just general awareness about an organization. The preference is using third-party endorsement from organizations like Class. Uh, traditional thought leadership, where you're really trying to, to get that unbiased opinion and and favoritism of your product or organization in the industry. And then demand is really what are you putting into the pipeline? Uh, so marketing, you know, um, outside of awareness and preference, but working directly with sales organizations within a company to drive that, that pipeline, which, you know, is, is truly, you know, the most measurable ROI, but things like awareness and, uh, and metrics and measuring KPIs there. It's uh, obviously engagement on your website, um, you know, um, paid clicks. What are you pushing through, um, from a, a digital marketing content marketing perspective? What are number of views, impressions you're getting from a social media perspective and strategy um, to how are you engaging on the PR front? That's kind of old fashioned. I mean, PR has changed dramatically. That's one area that's really changed over the years with the advent of truly kind of digital and, and, and the growth of social media uh, preference. Uh, you know, I mentioned class for those, those that are familiar with class, watching your, your class score improve. Uh, and getting kind of those unbiased uh, kind of Gartner points, if you will, also, you know, working with organizations like Gartner to grow to grow where you are in their magic quadrant. Um, mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, working with industry leaders to further your thought leadership and metrics around that. Again, you know, what, what, how are you improving on your class score? How are you improving from a a thought leadership perspective and the metrics there are, you know, related to your content marketing, for instance, how many white papers you, you, you pushing out that, you know, might have a, um, an industry speaker, industry leader. There's a lot of trade show aspects in the both awareness preference. And then demand is really, you know, very simple, truly measurement. And then probably the easiest ROI you have, what are you pushing into the uh, sales pipeline? From an outbound perspective and an inbound perspective, so are you know are all is is your awareness and pre or are your awareness and preference strategies working to grow the sales pipeline? And I think all three are exclusive of each other, but all three are also inclusive of each other and very, very truly, you know what I would call integrated marketing when you put those three three buckets together. Yep, I know that you have had some experience working with some formidable organizations that are selling pretty far up the food chain in the healthcare administration world. Talk about some of the challenges that you've experienced in, in going after those targets, right? From a marketing perspective, because, you know, I know that you've been, you've been, uh, working to attract the attention of chief information officers, working to attract the attention of tech, you know, or needing to talk to chief technology people, CEOs, uh, you know, that's, 
and all those are uh, some of the most you know uh, we're we're very fond of saying saying we're trying to sell <laughs> into some of the most highly targeted human beings on the planet and uh and and so I'm just curious what your experience been like that and what what are some of the ways that you've seen work uh in that regard and as far as getting the right type of engagement and the right type of eyeballs yeah, absolutely. So, so the golden parachute of healthcare marketing is reaching that C suite, and uh, you know, getting getting the attention of uh, of the C suite is is probably number one, especially when you're talking, you know, about a an, an, a demand yeah. program with sales. But I think you know there there's there's ways you reach that C suite, um, and I, I look at it as kind of a ladder. You kind of have to start by creating kind of a grassroots effort uh, within the organization, creating awareness of your product or, or your service, um, and working up the chain from the influencer to to more of a decision maker to ultimately the one that, that signs off on it. And, and different healthcare organizations um, require different strategies. I think the biggest challenge over the, the past few years has just been the level of, of M&A in the healthcare market. A lot of provider organizations um, that used to be more accessible now are becoming more corporately owned with, uh, with chains, very well known, you know, ho uh, hospital operators, for instance. Uh, there's ways to reach C-suite. Again, you know, it's, it's a grassroots effort. Um, a lot of that has to do, I think, with truly scholarship you just can't run the demand program into the c-suite it's it's next to impossible too many gatekeepers um too many email filters too many too many uh obstacles get in the way but um but getting those those contacts are key and i mentioned relationships earlier this is definitely a relationship industry it's how you build those relationships uh but Again, I, I look at, you know, truly that that integrated marketing approach to to creating awareness, preference and demand. And you have to hit all three three of those to really reach the C-suite, especially on the preference level where you're trying to get that unbiased approach into um, into an organization, into your target, if you will. And the, the better you can create kind of a thought leadership strategy, in my opinion, is one of the strongest ways to uh, to do that. But again, you have to have all the fundamental elements in place. You start getting the attention of a C-suite. You have to have a very effective website. You have to have a very effective content marketing approach and be seen as a leader in what whatever you're trying to deliver. Yeah, I think that um, I'm, I'm really glad to hear you say that, Tom. I think that it is, first of all, often lost on a number of people to to uh, uh, the importance of building ground support, right? Because we're looking at, typically we're looking at broad ecosystem solutions. We're talking about long sales cycles that have a lot of influencers in them. And if you're going after, <laughs> it, it is almost always a, a proper and a good tactic to build the kind of support on the ground that helps trickle things up to those those decision makers and it is not a light investment you know if you're if you're wanting to push a marketing effort and expecting in six months to sell something substantial into a health system that's not an easy expectation to fulfill because uh, that first of all, the you know from first hearing to decision, you might be six months or eighteen months away. But um, but to when, to invest in creating the kind of brand awareness, the kind and injecting the kind of thought leadership that actually will move the needle, it often requires a pretty substantial investment going after a whole ecosystem of people. Um, that are going to contribute to their voice into why do we why should we ex, uh, explore this solution? And I think that that's a, a that's an important thing that can to just underscore. Uh, I see a lot of impatience um, 
in this realm uh, and a, a lot of uh, unrealistic expectations from everywhere from uh, company leadership to the board members um, where there's there's just this Un gross underestimation of what it takes to build the kind of awareness it takes to win favor. And much of that comes through really substantial, you know, time intensive thought leadership, like you said, because it, if, if you want to turn somebody's head, it's not going to be with an ad. It's going to be with a meaningful assertion that helps them to a better place. And, you know, and, and we talk about this all the time. I mean, what, what our objective is, is to create some sort of resource that is of a caliber and, and, and substantial enough that, that when it finds a CIO of, of the right organization, that they look at it and go, okay, these guys, you know, they've, they've just enhanced my perspective. I'm going to share this with these three of my peers that I respect and I know that when I do that, they're going to respect me more because I've just given them something. That's the objective to me, you know, is to try and create that caliber of, of assertion, which doesn't happen in a, in a pithy product focused blog post. Um, Absolutely. You, you have to love it when a CEO, when you, when you launch a campaign and, and two days later, a CEO comes in, where's my leads? <laughs> That happened to you like, before? Oh yeah, <laughs> once or twice. Because um, it is an investment. I mean, you, you mentioned it. It is an investment, and it's not just dropping the email or direct direct mail piece. It's 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 creating a strategy that does reach kind of the influencer, you know. And and, and it's really about value. What what are you showing the you know the influencer to make them look good? I think one way. You know, is uh, is think about that. What what value are you providing, and do you have a value proposition that is going to to help that influencer share your content up the food chain to make them, you know, to to make it worth the the while and the time to have their bosses and their their executives read, uh, you know, more than a blog post like you said. And again, it's 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 repetition also. You just can't do it once and be done with it and expect results. Um, most of our, you know, most of our contents are very, I'm sorry, most of our contacts are very savvy. They, they've been in the industry a long time. They know, you know, what's real, what's attainable and what's achievable. And um, if you're putting something out that's truly pie in the sky and beyond, you know, that, that level, you're not going to get the results at all you want. So, Tom, talk about um, what are some of the channels that you've seen be successful for getting that out? I mean, you, you mentioned class, which obviously is one of several um, validators that exist out there. And, you know, there's all sorts of uh, uh, controversy about how I say controversy. Maybe that's overstated, but maybe suspicion is a fair word about how objective those elements can be. But but. You know, there there is only so many, um, so many channels like that, and that's certainly one of them. But talk about what you've seen be effective for ways to get out the kind of thought leadership and 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 uh, validated assertions that end up being meaningful. Yeah, there's. The strategies or strategies I've used are multiple channels. So there's not just one one yep. magic channel to work. No 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 silver bullet. You really have to work across the spectrum. And you know, working with uh, groups like industry associations, I believe, are key. So positioning yep. yourself as a leader within those associations. And as we know in healthcare, there are many. I mean, because there's many functions. Um, you know, you look at the revenue cycle side with uh, groups like HFMA to uh, access managers with NAHAM to uh, to groups like Tennessee Hymns, which focus on healthcare, uh, you know, health IT. Um, and there's IT involved in everything you look at in tech. But again, I think the channels are are multi and varied. I don't think there's one that you work. You have to work all the channels. But the key to really working that is making sure you're seen as a leader and having a, a solid content strategy in place 
that helps you do that. Um, you know, social media probably won't reach the sea levels, but will probably reach more of the influencer base. Um, but pointing them back to meaningful val value content is is key. Um, I wish I wish there was one channel because if we honed <laughs> in on that, we would all we we be successful time and time again. And it, it you mentioned it earlier, and you said that it, it's it's an investment. It's an investment, a long term investment usually. Um, and uh, you know, unless you have a magic widget that everybody wants right away, there's 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 no way around that. Yeah, and it is investment in time and patience. Yeah, I think that that's that's one of the things I I typically will look at in this market is just a, a very um, I what I'm what I've been hearing myself say recently is either do marketing or don't. Right, and that's and. A good point. Be, because doing it part way and having a, a a partial commitment to test the water and see if it works is is not a good strategy because if you're tentative it, it, first of all it it's a persistent thing if you're looking at it let's try it for something for six months you're you're only it takes you six months to turn the switch on absolutely that's um right. it doesn't it, it, and if you have an expectation at the end of six months to have seen something actually move, um, that that's not realistic. You get to start seeing it move at the end of six months of an, of determined effort, and then we can start measuring. You know, and, and so um, that's something that I I've I've realized, and what I hear you echoing and 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 kind of affirming in that is, no, it's not just it's not just one meaningful assertion. It's a continuous drum beat because by the time somebody, you know, they missed your first one, you know, chances are they missed your first one. Maybe a few folks saw it and then the, you make the second one and then it, it, it starts the snowball, right? I mean, it, it starts building and you build a reputation of having something worth saying and people start tuning into your channel. Um, and, and then you're, and at that point you're at a year. Right. I mean, it's it's taken a year to establish that that level. And that's after persistent, substantial assertion and activity. And then <laughs> and then you can start building from that foundation. But don't don't unless you've really um, made a significant push, don't have expectations that it's just going to be able to dribble in there. Yeah, I'd rather have a, a marketing budget that is longitudinal over a year or two years with realistic expectations and then throwing that same amount of a marketing budget to a six month campaign that just is chaotic and looks, you know, to the market disjointed. And, and sometimes you look desperate when you do that. And I think, you know, a very thoughtful approach where you're investing the dollars over a year to two years to, uh, roll out a product, make a splash, like you said, is not realistic. I mean, you just can't do that in this day and age. There's too many competing messages and too much noise. And I think, you know, the industry has gotten to the point where, you know, that type of approach is, is filtered out. Yep. What are you seeing um, in, in your, uh, you know, contemporary engagements and, how, and when you're, when you're talking to, uh, the folks that you're working with now, what are you seeing as some of the primary problems facing healthcare that that technology has the opportunity to really solve or be a significant player in solving? What are some of those hot buttons right now? Yeah, obviously, um, there's a lot of talk around artificial intelligence. I kind of hate to use that two letter AI word, but uh, but artificial intelligence is creating and has for a number of years in different segments of the industry. But artificial intelligence is, is a technology that holds a lot of promise and a lot of fear, um, you know, from both a, a caregiver perspective to the administrative side. Um, but um, challenges that 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 it addresses are, are numerous from efficiency, quality, but you still have to have the human touch in it. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, and, and the core of my background, um, 
in in my early days of healthcare marketing, truly, you know, on the revenue cycle side is it's just keeping the lights on. I mean, being viable in the industry, being there for your patients is, is key. And you really have to, from a, a, a perspective, a, a healthcare provider perspective, is make sure you're, you're viable and that you can deliver on the services and promise you give your community. Um, and there's numerous, you know, ways to do that. And the conversations around value-based care, care coordination, to simple implementation of a, of a health record that stretches, you know, across your your realm of care as a patient is is still very much in in conversation. And and, and it seems like, you know, over 30 years, the conversation, um, in many ways, hasn't changed a whole lot, but the delivery has. So, you know, the, the promise we have or, or healthcare providers have for their communities and delivering care for the patients and being the, the top provider in the community is, is key. But I will tell you, competition has, uh, competition among providers has, you know, reached probably all time highs. And so, hey, you differentiate yourself. And if you're a vendor that provides services into a provider organization, how can you help them be more competitive? How can you help them keep the lights on and you know have a return on their investment as much as ROI has probably been downplayed more over the last few years than previous previous years? But how can you provide a return to them that makes it meaningful and help them achieve their their goal of truly caring for their populations? That's that's kind of a long-winded answer, but uh, there's so many facets to it. It's it's really really unbelievable. And every every healthcare provider and organization has their own different different goals, but they all want to be there for the long term. And that's really yeah. really key. Yeah, I think what you bring out there is something we've heard echoed pretty frequently here: is that you've got to nail your value equation. Absolutely. Um, yep. and, and it's more important now than it's ever been because the budgets are tighter and they, they've never been, they've never <laughs> exactly. been loose, but they are tighter now than they've ever been. And, and so when you're, if, if the CIO is, is on your equation and you, you have to know that that person is balancing a wealth of opportunity. You know, they, they have any number of vendors coming to them saying they've got something that's going to result in some sort of saving somewhere for somebody and make something easier for somebody. And, and, you know, so there's lots of claims and if your claim and, and their job, you know, they, they are looking at a, a, a broad spectrum of opportunity with a narrow budget. And what they have to find a way to do is deploy those funds for the maximum good. And so if, if you're asking for a chunk of their, a share of their wallet, you've got to have that value equation dialed in really strong and have that something that you're ready to fly forward as a, an opportunity for their organization. And if you don't, it, it's going to be really hard to win in this uh, you know, if it's fuzzy, if it's, if, if they, if you don't have good validation and other people that are saying this has been truly valuable, here's our numbers. Uh, that's going to be a hard thing to do. Yeah. I, I think every vendor is trying to do the same thing. And that is to get that mind share of the CIO from a health tech perspective and, and show how you're different, but there's, you know, there's only so much mind share you can get from any, at any given time. And your priority may not be his or her priority at that time also. So yep. that's, again, where the patient's aspect comes in because you may become a priority. Your solution that they're looking for may become a priority down the road. So it's that repetitive, that long-term strategy that you have to, to keep in mind. And when you talk about developing a marketing plan and, 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 and gaining reach into, uh, into an organization, Again, you know, I always kind of go back to the influencer level, keeping that, you know, those, those contacts warm, keeping the content fresh um, for that influencer level. So when the, for that influencer level, so when the time is right and they share that white paper, they share a link back to your website, blog posting that it's relevant to them at the time. 
It's like, oh yeah, we're trying to address this problem. I remember seeing that somewhere in the search, find it and find your website and point their boss to the blog that, that got their attention. So Tom, I'm curious, I know that you have been the, the top marketing leader for a number of companies in this space. I am curious how you look at your relationship with the CEO in, in that realm and, and how you've navigated that in the past. I know I've heard lots of different stories from lots of different people <laughs> about the nature of that relationship and the importance of it. Um, and I also know that the chief marketing officer for tech companies is one of the shortest tenured positions historically <laughs> on in the C-suite. And, uh, and I know that you, you have managed to have some longer than average 10 years. So, um, I'm curious what you've learned in, in your experience about the importance of that relationship and, and how you've navigated it. Yeah. So I think two or three things come to mind immediately. One is setting realistic expectations. Uh, so which we've talked a lot about in this context. <laughs> absolutely. Again, when you launch a campaign, don't, you know, don't set the expectation that, oh, we're going to have, you know, six leads in a week um, that are going to fill a pipeline or 30 leads in a week. But set the expectation that, hey, this is long term program, this long term strategy, our investment will pay off. Um, become an ally. I think one, one thing, too, is become an ally of the CEO, become an ally of your boss, because we know that a lot of times that, um, you know, ideas come from all different areas of the organization. And sometimes the marketing executive, it's too easy for someone to point the finger at you. Hey, go launch this. Go do this. We've, we've got the best solution out there. But come back to the, the CEO, come back to to the executive levels and the board, if necessary, and say, hey, yeah, this is a great solution. You know, from a marketing perspective, we've done our research. We've done done the background on this. And, you know, we, the time we don't feel is right, but we need to start laying the foundation. So truly kind of with StratiPoint Advisor, I really emphasis on the advisor perspective too. Be, be, be a trusted advisor in your organization and be a champion across the board. Um, be a champion of the strategy of the organization. Be a strategy of the vision, um, and always kind of go back to those those two two factors in everything you do from a marketing standpoint. Make sure you're living up to the promise of your company and the promise your CEO is making to to his or her board. Yeah, that that's good. I think that that's uh, that's really critical to get on the same side. And I know that you know one of, one of the things I've seen is somebody will get hired because they've made some unrealistic promises just even in the in, in the onboarding yeah, process yes. in the interview yes. process even and and it's one of the worst and, and i do believe that that's part of why the tenure the average tenure that i've heard is typically uh is typically somewhere in the realm of 18 months um yeah and the reason for that is often expectations are set way up here um, when when people are are joining and they've not done themselves or their organization the favor of say, setting realistic expectations, which we talked about. I mean, it is it is unusual to turn on a dime in this in this arena. It's a it's a big a big long investment and helping people understand the difference between. <laughs> The it's a, the difference between lead generation and demand generation, for instance, like not marketing's Absolutely. job to do lead generation. It's marketing's job to help create demand. And and so if you're if you're trying to if you have a lead generation expectation, that's gonna that's gonna be disappointing right out of the gate. Right, and, and I think you align yourself with sales in that that regard as well. I think it's extremely important to set that differentiation. Um, because again, you know, the CEO come in, how many leads did I get? Well, you know, from campaign, that's really, we created, we created demand for the sales team to follow up on the leads or, you know, some organization account management team, maybe uh, if it's into your existing customer base and you're rolling out a new product, but you can't expect to be the ownership of the final result of those, those leads or those demand, um, 
metrics that come in, you have to be able to deliver on, on again, the promise and expectation that you're going to create demand. And demand comes from multiple different areas. Um, you know, I think um, event management is a, is a good example of that. You know, you're going to a trade show, or if you're going to HIMSS, for instance, you know, go there and be, be you know, set the expectations realistically. Each year is different when you attend HIMSS. Each focus is different. Every year, you know, is is a different focus. You had meaningful use for, you know, for a number of years. Now everybody's talking about artificial intelligence. Um, then one year it might be more around care coordination and population health solutions. So you have to really know where you fit in. And if your solutions don't fit into the core core thought of, of that, then you need to set the expectation and maybe lower it. And that's tough, tough as marketers to do because we, we want to go be successful. We love what we do and we think we can go, you know, create as much demand and interest in our products as, as we can. But sometimes you have to set that expectation at a lower level and that's hard to do. Yep. Yeah. Cause if you, you're, if you're in this industry, you're in it, you're, you're typically in to win and you, you want to make people happy. And, yep. uh, and so the temptation is always there to put the, the expectation bar up high, but, uh, keeping yep. it real. I have many scars, to, you know, from, from early in my career about that, because, uh, you know, if you, you want it, you, you think you can, and you think you can be wildly successful, uh, given, given a budget and, and the target. Yep. Yeah, that is true. Um, I'm curious, and, and we talked a little bit about the value of partnerships, um, and, you know, working with analysts working in, in, and associations How, talk about your experience with partnerships overall in, in your marketing tenure. What have you, how do you see the value of that? How has that worked in your favor? You know, what have you seen be particularly effective? Any, any words on, on and around that? Yeah, I think partnerships are extremely important in, 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 in any industry. Um, specifically, you know, in healthcare, there's so, you know, again, so much mind share you have out there. Uh, so I've, I've managed partnerships, um, in, in multiple ways. I mean, you, you know, truly kind of channel management, channel partners, resellers, but creating true partnerships that create lasting relationships are really what, what matter. Um, you know, and I say that meaning you align yourself with the right kind of partners. You align yourself with partners that um, can help you get into and get noticed by the organizations you're targeting. But I think creating partnerships with with those who can help you deliver your goals with organizations like marketing agencies, with organizations like as you know. Uh, specific uh, healthcare industry associations, those partnerships, you have to work it all across every channel. Uh, but I'm a big believer in partnerships. I'm a big believer that there's value in, in numbers in a way with meaningful, relevant partners. Um, and again, I think the key word there is relevant. You know, you have to have the right, right partner. Um, but alliances, partnerships, whatever you want to call it, are, are valuable in, in, um, uh, in healthcare by far, uh, relationship management, reputation management is key and having the right partner to help you knock down those barriers and, and overcome objections, um, are key. It's more, it's more than just exposure and, uh, you know, it's deep and, and it's more than a partnership. It's a deep, deep relationship that truly makes a difference. And what you find out after you really start working on a partner strategy and, and looking at who your partners are, you might hone in on a few that you have those deep relationships with. And then you, you have a, another tier that's more higher level that you're just associated with. And it's where you put your dollars and, and your your time, you know, to, to get the investment out that makes the most sense. Absolutely. That's a great word. That is a great word. It is. <clears throat> and I think it's... Um, I think that that level of collaboration is something I see um, 
being a little less common in a lot of the with with some of the younger organizations. I, I think it's and I think that it is reforming. I think there is a different way that people are engaging. Um, you know, a lot's changed in in the in the last bit, but I think that that our you know the 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 digital virtual world we live in tends to be a little bit isolating and i think that uh that that has done something to diminish the the perceived value of those relationships and it's how the world still works you know and i think that figuring out how to uh how to form and optimize for that i think it's a big part of marketing's job as you look at the outward focus and uh and i think that that does lead me to another uh question in your experience you know i i know that one of the changes that i see happening is the convergence of sales marketing and product into into a unified uh, growth engine. I think it's one of the essential things that an organization coming to market in our world needs to be focused on. And I'm curious your experience there, because I know you've worked in a variety of them and I'm sure you've seen them as very isolated uh, silos and you've seen more integrated functions. I'm, I'm curious to hear your perspective on how to bring those together and what you've seen be successful. Yeah, uh, definitely different companies I've worked for. Uh, they've either been in different different departments, different organizations. I've worked in companies where they've been part of part of marketing or under under some kind of strategy role, at least with a unified leader. Uh, you really have to cross the organization, and it goes back to kind of that advisor role within an organization if you're a, a marketing professional and that is you know bringing together those different silos there's nothing worse than being a, a marketer not getting the, the information you need or understanding what the strategy is that is trying to happen across and to be deployed across an organization um, so I've always tried to bring together those organizations not necessarily advocated that they be under under marketing but make sure we are working closely together um, I think, you know, from a, a, one of my, my core beliefs in marketing is that you have to, to think of yourself as, as a unifier in, in any company and you have to have really good relationships among the, the disparate departments. Um, and I think that's one thing that's, that I've been successful with and has helped contribute to my success is working across the organization where product marketing or product management, uh, if it sits outside of traditional marketing, it's working together. I mean, you have to understand the roadmap. You have to, to understand what the product does and it's, it's basic entirety. Um, you know, what's being demoed, what's being talked about and really what the value is. And that's really the core of it is understanding the value and how you how you deliver that value in your marketing strategy. Um, not sure if that answered your question, but it, it, it's truly, truly an approach that cannot be siloed. Um, those yep. those three organizations have to work in tandem, have to work together. Um, and, 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 and to be honest, it's been a challenge in some parts, in, you know, of my career in different times. And, um, you know, sometimes barriers are put up, whether it's politically or just by the culture of an organization. And sometimes you have to be brave enough to break down those silos and, and change culture. And that's not, not always perceived favorably in the beginning, but usually the end result is a very favorable approach. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> that is, <laughs> it is definitely a difficult subject in some organizations, but I think if we're looking at the, the organizations I've seen be most successful in today's climate have the least amount of separation in the, in, in those realms. I think what you said, I, I love what you said about being the unifying force. I think that that's the word you use. Uh, I I, th I regard mark the marketing function as the translation layer um, for the organization. Oh, I, I, I think that 
it's really important for marketing to be able to move seamlessly across those lines because at the end of the day we're the we're the we're on the point of, to communicate things out to the the world and we have to and and what is communicated out has to be a harmonious consistent clear picture and the only way to get that is is by a very integrated seamless alignment between those those three and the rest of the organization too but i think those are the essential ones that you have to bring together um along with the ceo who ultimately is is knit directly into all uh all three of those segments but that that really is a it's a key understanding i see for companies now and something i try and promote with our clients uh when, especially when i see the divisions and the rivalries that can crop up there mm -hmm. let, let me just say it out loud there there's no room for rivalry here um right. It, right. it it just is it's toxic and destructive and takes too much energy away from what needs to be a unified combined effort. And I tell people, you know, I, I've been as bold to tell people that are looking at, at different organizations, um, to go into, to be, to, to take, take, <laughs> to take inventory of what that looks like. Because if it's, if, first of all, if you've got an organization where those three are knit together, that, that is a good thing. And that's important DNA. If they're not overcoming the dysfunction is maybe not something you want to try and do um, right. at the right. end of the day, because that's a systemic issue that takes it. It, it has to be uh, actively worked on and broken down. And to, to, for the agil the agility that companies need in this market, it's really important to have, have those three working together, as one uh, one one entity focused on growth. Yep, I, I totally agree, and uh, I think it, you know, depending on what what's going to happen, marketing budgets could be tighter. So you really have to have that that relationship across the organization. And uh, like I like what you said about the translation layer. I love that that uh, that term, the marketing being the translation layer. Um, and I think that's a, a really apt way to say that. Yep. Yes, indeed. Well, um, Tom, I'm curious, just as we, uh, as we finish up here, what would, if you had a piece of advice to somebody leading into this market right now, we've covered a lot. And, and so if you had a headline to, to bring across, uh, you know, that one thing, uh, what would you, uh, what would you underscore? Yeah, I would say be true to yourself from a marketing perspective, from a marketing pro professional perspective. And by that, I mean, set the expectations, know what you can deliver, lead your teams. I mean, we're, you know, we're kind of talking about executive level you know, marketing roles. So lead your teams and engage with partners that can help you be successful. So be true to yourself. And then I would just, I would just end, end it would say, have fun too. If you're not having fun, don't do it. So yeah. you have no to have doubt. fun. Yeah. It's not fun every day, but have fun overall. <laughs> well, that's, that's definitely a good word. Um, hey, I know we've got, uh, we've got some stuff coming up in and around Tennessee hymns. Uh, so I just wanted to take a second to, to shout out something that we've got coming up. Uh, Tom, do you want to kind of, uh, set the deck for what, for the event we've got coming? Yeah. So from a, uh, from a Tennessee hymns perspective, you know, we've always worked, uh, kind of at, at definitely an education and thought leadership level, but really kind of more focused on, uh, on, on our members and, and the roles that we we focus on, but I will be a little bit biased here when I say this as a, a, a long time marketing professional looking across, you know, our members and our, you know, our um, partners and our sponsors that really provide the value to us. You know, John, you know, I've talked about this is what can we deliver back to those marketers to help them be successful? And so Tennessee Hymns is proud to, to be working with Golden Spiral to deliver 
a, a marketing seminar, a series of seminars to, to help you just do that. And, and, and how can you be successful in your efforts as a, as a health tech organization and as uh, the, the one leading marketing with your organization? So I'm really excited about it. And uh, we're, we're definitely proud to, to partner with, with you, longtime uh, par- uh, partner and sponsor of Tennessee Ems. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. It's going to be fun. What I what I want to say is, you know, what I what I know about Tom, what I know about our uh, our Tennessee Hymns organization, what I know about Golden Spiral, is we're we're not you know what our involvement is and what we look at certainly transcends <laughs> health tech marketing. We're really interested in, you know, I believe that technology has to play a, 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 a very essential role in healthcare in the future because all the equations are adding up to we're not going to have enough providers for the demand. I mean, that's the, the bottom line. And the way that that's going to be solved is helping our providers be more effective and efficient in treating more people. And, and technology is a, it has to be a part of the solution. So in some sense, I'm investing in my future because I'm going to be part of that big bubble that's going to endanger of bursting in the next couple decades. Um, as, as those equations shift to unmanageable by today, by today's operative, operative standards, an unmanageable curve. And, and so I'm interested in helping the technology companies that are trying to move into healthcare to help healthcare work be more effective because we need it. And, and so, uh, that's part of our mission as an organization. And, uh, and so anything we can do to be helpful is, uh, is part of what we're wanting to do. And that's why we're teaming up with Tennessee hymns to offer what I hope is a very valuable, uh, set of insights that can help, you connect more effectively with your market and uh and so we'll be sharing more information about coming that uh the first installments coming up here in a couple of weeks the first part of june uh we'll have some information connected directly to this uh this podcast that you can take a look at and uh and take advantage of but tom again i'm really appreciative of of your support tom is Part of our advisory board, and as you've heard and seen, you can get some idea of the value that he brings and the and the perspective that uh, that Tom comes with, uh, a wealth of knowledge and ecosystem understanding that uh, that helps us as an organization provide value, um, but also a, a certainly a good resource in the context of his advisory service that he offers. We'll be linking to to his, uh, his information directly too. Um, so uh, Tom, again, thank you for joining us today. Great conversation.